It is always a joy to serve the Lord. And it is a great privilege to share His words to our audience throughout the whole world. Our topic this time is Religious Works Judge as Treason in Heaven. Quite challenging topic. Because we who are Christians, there are so many things that people have misunderstood about works. So, I want to present this topic, religious works judged as a treason in heaven. The question is why? why? Which religious works for the praise and the glory of God and which religious works judge as treason in heaven's tribunal? We need to understand because many, many, many Christians really are doing into good works. But which good works really? Religious works for the praise and for the glory of God. And so, I want to present at least five kinds of relig religious works done by the Christians while serving Christ. Because our hands is so busy producing good works. Good works comes from our mind. And it is executed to our hands. And so, these five kinds of relig religious works done by the Christians while they serve Christ, let's see in our analysis and what the Bible says, what are the works that are for his praise and glory. So, the question on the works on the New Testament, God's plan was revealed before human was created. For we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God has prepared beforehand, that is, making ready that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, verse 10. Meaning to say, before the eternal ages, before man was created, there was already a plan that God created, will create human. Okay, for good works. So humans were created for the purpose of doing good works. This plan has never been changed. The motive of work changed only after Adam and Eve fall into sin in the Garden of Eden. The New Testament presents different categories of works done by those who claim that they were serving God. And doing works for him. The numbers of people who do not keep the law of God throughout the whole world are staggering. It is because scholars, ministers, and preachers are making sweeping claims, assertions, interpretations that keeping God's law are not important under the dispensation of grace. Because law-keeping has been equated with legalism or salvation by works of the law. So, we'll look at first Galatians 3.20, no, 2.26 and Romans 3.20. Because people use this as their weapon of mass destruction because they are rejectionists of God's law. Because it says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3.20 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So, people use these two particular texts. Meaning to say, why we should work? Work is important because before 
we were created, there is already a laid plan that as God prepare us for creating humanity, good work is already part of the DNA of a person. So, why use, text, use this text in a sweeping all other texts that talk about of works of different contexts and meaning? <coughs> Excuse me. Is this view can hold water in the overall analysis regarding works? Why mix all the texts with Romans 3, 20 and Galatians 2, 16, which do not square from others? <coughs> all the New Testament writers are so careful in discussing works of the different categories and function in relation to serving God. So, here is it. The different kinds of works in relation to those who claim of serving God. The scripture is so clear in making distinctions of works done by those who claim to be the followers of Jesus Christ. In a broad outline, there are five. First, the works of the law. Second, the work of the flesh. Third, dead and evil works. Four, condemnatory works. The last but not the least, but the most important, good works of love and faith. Each of these works function differently. In a different context, different motives with different people who claim that they are serving God. We will look at each topic and no specific import rather than generalization as many readers of the Bible have done, which is a violence against the understanding of the word of God, his truth. So, let's start. Works of the law, what is it? There are questions that demand solid biblical answer. What is or are the works of the law? Who were doing this in biblical times and in the contemporary times? What are the biblical, biblical grounds why this work of the Christian serving God are not acceptable to him? What are the motives of the people why they engage the works of the law? These and other closely related questions demand biblical answer. Sometimes part of the answers are on the text, cited by the maverick, renegade, dissident, rejectionist of God's law, are on the Bible text that seems to support their understanding and interpretation. Let's understand this truth. The Jews and the Gentiles are all under sin. Paul begins in Romans 3 verse 1. That the Jews had advantage because to them committed the oracles of God. Other than this, the Jews and Gentiles are alike. All under sin. Verse 9. No one was righteous, therefore all are guilty before God. Verse 19. As a result... Law keeping cannot justify before God. Why? We are already guilty. We are already under sin. So Paul says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 20. So law keeping is not the way of God in making a person righteous or justified. Let me repeat. Law keeping is not the way. Of God in making the person righteous or justified. Paul answered, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all who believe. Romans 3, 19 and 22. So, God's only methods of justification is by faith. 
In fact, Paul several times in Romans 3 assert that God's methods of justification is by or through faith in Jesus Christ. And we found in Romans 3, 22, 26, 28, and 30, or justified by grace. Romans 3, 24, but being justified by faith does not entail doing away with the law. This is where the problem of most people, because when the Bible says, no one will be justified by the keeping of the law, but it is not saying that we have to do away with the law. Paul puts it in a balance. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So, when we read one part of the passage without looking the total context, we have a wrong interpretation. So, the word void comes from a Greek katargoomen, meaning do we nullify or make void? His answer was double emphatic. First, he says, me ginoito, meaning never may it be done. And the second is his tanumen, meaning we strengthen or we establish or we make the law strong. This is the mistake of most people who interpret that those who keep the law immediately say, okay, since we're not justified by the law, we are not bound to keep the law. But wrong, because Paul put it in balance. We cannot do away with the law. In fact, we make it strong, we establish it, we can never nullify the law. This is a very important way of understanding. Because law-keeping, to earn favor with God to be saved, is foreign to God's method since it is boasting. Okay? When one does not follow God's method of making righteous or justification, he perverts it and keeps it and does not work of the law by his own effort and his keeping wants to earn a favor or merit before God what he, that what he has accomplished. Hence, under the dominion and power of sin, the works of the law, that is, law-keeping, is useless. Because Paul says, that person is boasting. Romans 3, 27. It is because salvation is a gift. So you, you never work with salvation. It is God's work. Why you need to work to in favor so that you may be saved? It means to say, you have a proud heart, boasting. Because one need not to work the works for salvation, for by grace you had been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Boasting is against God because that's the character of the devil. So let us look at the gospel of those who are boasting before God. So, for example, Jesus taught someone who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Oh, trusted themselves. They did not trust about their righteousness and despised others. So Jesus says, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioner, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice. I give tithes of all that I possess. This is clear boasting before God of his work. This is not acceptable. To God, this is a treason. Because what was his method? You make your own method to be accepted by God rather than accept the terms of God of making us just or righteous. But the tax collector by faith saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
Jesus says, I tell you this man who went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself, that is boasting of what he has accomplished, he will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 18 verses 9 to 14. So human love to boast their accomplishment. But in the shadow of the cross and God's grace, that boasting has no place ever. So, look keeping to earn merit, to lead to salvation is boasting which is evil. Meaning to say, inordinate pride is the father of boasting. They come to the same family species of sin. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, that is the Jews. And they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God, Romans 4, 2. God's grace is sufficient to all sinner. why boast? And Paul confessed that God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Second Corinthians 12, man. Did you understand? He was not boasting what he accomplished. He boasted about his insufficiency, his infirmity, rather than what he accomplished, like the Pharisee. So this boasting is acceptable. But when you boast, I give tithe, I donated something, I do this one, I do this one. And he said, Lord, see what I have done? In human eyes, good but in heavens, that is treason. Because it's not acceptable. You cannot go all the good things to get a favor from God. Because he has already given you enough. So we need to understand. So there is an acceptable boasting before God. For God forbid that I should boast except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You boast the cross. Not your works. By whom the world has been crucified to me. And I tell to the world. Galatians 6.14. Therefore it is written. Let the one who boasts. Boast the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.31. So why are you not making the Lord? Our God is powerful. Jesus who died for us. He redeemed us with his rich mercy and grace. And loving kindness. You boast. Not your own. Boasting. In fact, he says, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. I must boast. I will boast the things concern my infirmity. God has chosen the lowly things of the world and despised the things that are not to nullify things that are so that no one will boast before him. 1 Corinthians 1, 28-29. Therefore, let no one boast in men. But now boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Meaning to say, when we boast before God, we're a little sons of the devil, according to James 4.16. We need to boast the cross of Christ because that is really beyond imagination how he loves humanity. We must boast the Lord for creating us, provided us everything. But you boast that you have accomplished something? Yes, to the eyes of men you can do it, but to God it is not. So, there is a problem with human nature. Always add something to faith. Why? Because we are justified by faith. But many, many people, they want to add faith, something. 
Of such one, I will boast. Yet of myself, I will not. Except my infirmities. For though I, it's my desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And Paul says, I really, I wanted myself to boast. But I would not do that. I would be a fool. So if you want to be called foolish, you keep boasting what you have done. In fact, Jesus says, do not let your right hand know what the left hand is doing. Here is the human problem. The human nature after the fall is that the lack of trust to God. He already assured that his grace is sufficient. The New Testament, until the end of time, there were and are always those good people in the church who want to add works to their faith or want to subtract something that the law of God that he declared do not do them. This is the problem. So, who were those who wants to be justified by the works of the law? It's clear. That the Jews, according to Romans 3.1, they have a lot of advantages. In fact, if we go to Romans chapter 9 and 10, especially referred to Israel or the Jews, but also followed by many Gentile converts. Paul said, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but at its will, by the works of the law. Clear. Romans 9, 30, 32. When you make another way, instead of walking God's way, that's the result. You add faith something or you subtract what God says. Look at again, Romans 10 verse 3. Israel seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God which is the righteousness by faith. Verse 6. So here we find again it is so important that we need to understand. The scribe and the Pharisees are expert in law, in works of the law. Who are the scribe and Pharisees? Oh, they are the most renowned teachers of the law. The interpreters of the law, learned men, expert. The Pharisees related to this group were commonly viewed as the most exemplary models of Judaism. They form a sect of Judaism and establish a code of morals and rituals more rigid than spelled out in the law of God gave to Moses, basing much on their practices of years of traditions. Thus, the scribe and Pharisees were both highly strict and highly respected in Judaism. Acts 26.5 Pharisee professed to be the purest practice of righteousness of the works of the law. But let us examine and the evaluation of Jesus between their claims and their practices. Jesus told the multitudes to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say, and do not do. For the blind Divine heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulder, but they themselves will not move them even one of their fingers. What an incredible religious life. Exactly opposite. But all their works, they do to be seen by men. They make their pilot citrus broad and enlarged borders of their garments. They love the best places at the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Matthew 23, 2-7. That's why they are called religious hypocrites 
are these people. And there are so many and so dangerous, not only in the time of Jesus, but all throughout the ages. So, this is it. We cannot, this work cannot be. That's why Jesus has the most escaping denunciations of these religious leaders. Because they were stage actors, church performers before men, but not to God. Christ's curses and denunciation were perfect for the word hypocrites appear seven times. The scary terms are difficult to swallow for deadly and it is no sitting. Hypocrites use eight times. Woes that is the curse eight times. He says blind guides two times. Full and blinds two times. Lawlessness. They were engaged in extortion, self-indulgent. The picture was not religious but more than secular. Deceptive for they appear as righteous to men. That's why I said this kind of works is a treason in heaven. Because it did not follow God's plan. It has always Connected with motives that are dangerous, showing actors. But you cannot do that with God. Because as I said, salvation is a gift. It's God's work, not human. Some of the people during the ministry of Jesus asked a significant question. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Very interesting. Have you heard this? Did you ever ask that question? What shall we do that we may work the works of God? They're interested in working. But Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe, have faith in him who sent me. John 6, 28-29. So all throughout the Gospels, Jesus appeals, believe to have faith in him. Grace is unmerited favor, so salvation is a gift. Because God is merciful, God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, because he loves us, even we were dead in trespass, made us alive together by Christ. By grace you had been saved. That's the work. We need to believe. We need to trust. Rather than believe our works, believe our performance that it has something points and favor to God. By grace and mercy, we are saved through the sacrifice of Christ. The biblical writers are in solidarity that God is raised in grace. So salvation is a gift of grace. Ephesians 3.7 that save us not by anything we have done, because God is rich in mercy, Ephesians 4, 2. His mercy is greater than any sin we have done. And this mercy is new every day. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed. Because of his compassion, fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. And Paul assert. Not by the works of the law we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Through, through regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 5. All this for the destitute repentant sinners had been provided. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7. And so why work? To earn favor. You need to go to do good work. Because God is work. God accepts that work. We are created for good works. But if you work so that you may say. Oh Lord I have worked so hard. I have sacrificed. No. Salvation is a gift. Salvation is an offer. You have to accept it. So, this is the devil's 
He, the devils perverted the gospel to deceive people. The devil's deception is so genius for it clothed in the garb of the gospel of God by obedience to God's law. Thus, performing works of righteousness or works of the law. The appearance is so attractive and thinly fine attached to Christ's command. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. So, salvation by grace is destroyed, for it is covered up by deceptive salvation by works. Deception is subtle and doubly deceptive through works of religious piety. Devotion and obedience in order to get favor, approval before God. Paul calls it another or different gospels. Galatians 1, 8. Which he fought ardently in Galatians chapter 3 to 6. And yet, the same deception is much alive today. So, let's go to the second type of works. The work of the lust of the flesh. What are the works of lust of the flesh? These are outworkings of a sinful nature. The old man that refuses to go away. A person serving Christ, but under still the dominion and the power of the flesh. The old nature, which is naturally sinful, still powerful, working against the Spirit of God, for it has not been replaced due to totality for conversion that is still on the process. The person mind has not yet totally surrendered to God. The believers have not yet become partakers of divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4 It is walking according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the son of disobedience, among whom also all once we conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and the mind and by nature, Children of wrath, just as others. What a dangerous work of the flesh. Before we become a Christian, this is the work we have done. And when we become Christian, they slowly come. Because there is the old man, the old nature. And sometimes they are so dominating that there is really difficulty of distinguishing whether he is a Christian or what. It is a misuse and abuse of agape love. Listen, John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, listen, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it is not from the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away, and the last of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. First John 2, verses 15 to 17. Did you understand that? What is now the, the works of the last of the flesh? That our eyes want to dwell where our flesh. This should be condemned. Because the work of the flesh are the result of Christians who did not die daily. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. No daily conversion, no daily justification, neither daily sanctification of the Holy Spirit. They are the maintenance in the name of Christian. So God's agape love is misused, abused, instead of transformation of character. That's the work of the lust of the flesh. So it is walking against the spirit of God. Walk in spirit and you shall fulfill. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Meaning to say, really you are an spiritual, a changed person. So he said, walk in spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. So there is a quarrel. The spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another. So that you do not do things that you wish. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the spirit, flesh is, are evident, which are adultery. Ah, here are the works of the flesh. That is being mentioned. That even the Christian are still engaged. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, rebellion, and the like. So it is clear. Paul was not talking the non-Christian. He was talking the Christians. So this is the work of the flesh. The catalog is low. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desire. If we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 24-25. But we find this in many churches. So that's why I said, in heaven, this kind of works, even you are a Christian, produced, but that is not produced by the Holy Spirit. It's another spirit who is producing it. Sad to say, this sat in the few of the church. Paul says, we will die if we walk and work of the flesh. The righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things on the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, Things of spirit. Meaning to say, those who walk, uh, they're really guided by the Holy Spirit. They, think, they always think of spiritual things. But those who has works of the flesh, they keep on thinking worldly evil things. That is then that is against God's will. And so he said, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because carnal mind is enmity against God. What is enmity? Enmity means continual opposing to God's will. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if your spirit put you to death, the deaths of the body, then you will live. As a Christian, sometimes we have two kinds of life. A life propelled, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and the other side is a life that is propelled by the power of the work of the flesh that is evil before God. So, we have already touched the works of the law, treason against heaven. The works of the flesh, while being Christian, when you don't change and repent, still treason, because those are condemnatory works. So let's go to the dead work. What are dead works? Is there thing, anything that we, we call dead? What are dead works? Dead works are mentioned twice in Hebrews 6, 6, 1 and 9, 4, 10. So the context determine correct interpretation. Dead works are activities or works of individual still had relationship with God, but whose Christian life almost is spiritually dead, thus devoid of power of grace and faith and the flame of the Holy Spirit. What are dead works? 
Hebrews 5 deals with a Aaronic priesthood. Their works and saints to a new priesthood, Melchizedek, and Hebrews utter has really lived a spiritual deterioration. If you read Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, Paul says, Hebrews, you ought to be a professor in the university, but now you are a student. Did you understand the deterioration? And he says, you become dull, slothful, in hearing God's instruction. From the rank of a teacher, demoted to a student. From adult to baby, because he cannot eat food for adult, but the liquid milk. A picture of a terrible struggle of a person in order to survive and to fight for life. That is the background of the text. Meaning to say, just imagine you are a professor. And now, you sit in the class as if a student learning to read ABC. That's why Paul says, anyone who has that kind of life produce dead works. So, still alive, but produce dead works. This is a different case with Ephesians 2, 1, where dead in trespasses and sin. These believers are not yet dead because they are still producing works, but did works. They are encouraged to repent, Hebrews 6, 1. They are not works of the flesh. They are not works of the law. Neither evil or works of wickedness. Therefore, they are works for maintenance, but its quality are dead works. You can do a lot of dead works. And many are not aware of it. You sing a music just to entertain people. Preach just to occupy time. Pray without mind and conscience what you are praying. These are dead works. Dead works are the works of our hands as Christians. To most of us, there seems a way that seems right to a man. But the end is the way of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Yet all our labors are useless. That's dead. If they do not connect, to the service of God. Any significant and esteem we attain from our labor apart from the end to bring glory to God and establishing his role upon earth are misplaced work. Therefore, they are dead works. It's just like a building built by engineers and laborers. And it was forgotten for some reason. And it is the nature that occupy it. They spend a lot of money, but it's a dead works. We engage sometimes with that. So, dead works that may appear good to us, even receive applause to others, but heaven find it repulsive and defiled by sin. In other words, unless we had been washed in the blood of Christ, all our good deeds are worthless, useless, vain, and dead. These works are little because the thing that most keeps people from Christ is the belief that they can be good without him. Their lives may be filled with good deeds in the eyes of men, but such work are not necessarily good in the eyes of God. Unfortunately, many have been led astray by the church as preachers and teachers have told them that the gospel is what they do. Live right, eat right, give right, and all the other rights. But the truth is, anything we do without or apart from living faith is sin. 
Romans 14, 23. So we are admonished to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9, 14. And so, it is important. Dead works are not only acceptable to God and acceptable, but an evil substitute for faith. God desires, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. These dead works are more deceitful. Why? For they appear good externally, but that spring out from a corrupt, or wrong motives, or done for a wrong reason. Therefore, are like filter rags before God. Dead works are work done without any holy joy or enthusiasm. In other words, these are work done out of compulsion, of necessity, for fear of punishment. For example, in returning tight money, God's love a cheerful giver. 1 Corinthians 9, 7. In everything God wants us, in everything is by cheerfulness. It is because God meets him who rejoices and does righteousness. We are commanded to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. But did works, you just fulfill it without the joy, empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's why they are dead. There is no joy. There is no enthusiasm. There is no righteousness in it. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of the heart for the abundance of everything. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and in everything, and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. What's that? When we do good works, let us do it with the gladness of the heart and joy, with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Dead works are doing things without joy, without cheerfulness, Without gladness, without praise, thanksgiving in our hearts. Works done without smear of love and fire of the Holy Spirit. Doing things in the name of God with calculated goodness just to accomplish compliance with maintenance mentality are all dead works. In all these things, we need to repent before the Lord. That's the appeal of Hebrews. Let's go now to the fourth kinds of work. Condemnatory works insinuated by the power of darkness. So condemnatory works, these are evil activities or works bereft of the power of the Holy Spirit and grace and have done by those who claim to follow Christ. This work are influenced by the power of the ruler of darkness. Ephesians 6.12 Or the ruler of this world as Jesus said in John 12.31 That is before conversion but sometimes occur when Christians are deceived since they are thinking already serving Christ. We have no fellowship with unfruitful works of the darkness, Paul says, but rather expose them. Ephesians 5.11 Not walking in the light, but in darkness. This condemnatory works not worth mentioning, as Paul said. It is shameful even to speak to those which are done in them by the secret. Ephesians 5.12 the works done before becoming a Christian, and now you were once alienated, an enemy in your mind, wicked works, yet how he reconciled you. Colossians 1.21 But in many occasions, the work returns like an old man that refuses to go away. The world cannot hit you, but it hits me because I testify it that its works are evil. By not practicing, 
walking or living the truth, Christian, commit the works of the darkness. That's what John says, 1 John 1, 6. Since God's children are walking in the light, walking in the darkness is walking in the enemy of God, Satan, and become the children of darkness. And that's why the those works are condemnatory because they are the work of the darkness. Works done against by Christ. But I was with you daily in the temple. You did not lay hands on me. But this hour and the power of the darkness are yours, Jesus said. Those who malign, hated, persecuted Christ in the name of God and religion have committed these condemnatory works. Jesus says, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest their deeds should be exposed. John 3, 19 and 20. These are condemnatory works. Paul says the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the work of the darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Romans 13, 12. Let's go to the last. Because one to four, according to the heavenly judgment, all these works, works by the war, works of the law to earn salvation is a treason. Did works is not acceptable. Works of the flesh are not acceptable. Let's go now. The placement of good works in salvation by faith. So that we understand. Those who believe and obey God's law, let's look at and even good works. I call this good works of love and faith. The New Testament is full of action words. I am divine, you are the princess. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The picture here is one of consent and cooperation between God and human. It teaches that a same person, efforts or work cannot be separated from God's in feeling and empowerment to fulfill good works that are God-pleasing, God-glorifying. Let me repeat that. Cooperation, consent. Because he gave us strength. And out of that love and faith, we produce God-pleasing, God-glorifying works. That's why Paul can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. To this end, I work. He's striving according to his working, which he worked in me mightily. Good works are a result of God's work in man's willingness and cooperation. This is God's pleasing. This is God's glorifying work. In fact, the scripture asserts of doing good works, which is acceptable in heaven, because it is a mark and evidence that the heart is already converted and the Holy Spirit is the one dominant life. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for a fruit, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here are good works, commendable for the praise and glory of God. Good works are part of inspiration and revelation. Therefore, good and pleasing to God. But used to profit something related to salvation is almost an unpardonable sin. Christians should do good works because God is good. And all the good comes from God. Every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadows. According to James 1.17. So what are good works? They are the result of a sibling relationship. 
The presence and the absence of saving faith in the hearts will be shown by the presence and the absence of good works of love in our lives. Good works are not the ground of our salvation, but the fruit of a saving relationship. All our good works dependent on the power outside ourselves. Christ of Lesson 150. Although fruit is produced in our life, it is the fruit of the Spirit, not man's fruit. The heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth fruits of the Spirit. Pachek and Prophets 372. Thus, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What you find it is these are the character of Jesus Christ emulated by those who have a saving relationship with God. So, we are not saved by good works. But when we commit our lives fully to God, we want to do to please Him and do His will. Such our good works are grateful response to what God has done, not to gain favor or merit or a point because we are already saved. The purpose of good works are the result of indwelling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit is for the glory of God according to His plan. This has been repeated in the scriptures all throughout. So, is it for God's glory, not man, because a converted man simply reflect God's goodness towards all. Since God is good, so man as he serve him does good works, not to be commended for salvation. So Paul says categorically, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. The apostle approvingly speak, faith working through love. Galatians 5, 6. He command to Thessalonians the work of faith and labor of love. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. Even calls the believers the obedience of faith. He repeated that in Romans 1, verse 5 and 16, 26. When we accept Christ, good works will appear as fruitful evidence that we are in the way of life, that Christ is our way, and that we are treading the true path that leads to heaven. Good works are works of faith and a spirit-filled, empowered action that requires human effort and cooperation, according to Paul in several passages of the scriptures. So, good works of love and faith are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. A same person does not work to get saved. It's produced for a believer alive in Christ. Good works of love and faith are accomplished by men through cooperation with God. These works of faith flow out of a saving relationship with Jesus. They are energized by the power of the Holy Spirit and they are shaped, softened by God's love. And so, there is divine imperative of good works of love and faith. So Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father. It's to glorify God. It's not to make boast before God. Then they said, what shall we do? Oh, you believe. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, when they speak against you as evil doers, they may by good works which observe glorify God. So let us consider one another in order to stir love and good works. This is an imperative. Purify himself as some people, zealous for good works. Remind them to be subject to ruler, authorities, obey, ready for every good works. And those who believe in God should maintain good works. And let our people learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that may be not be unfruitful. All this close proximity References of good works are in the context of justification. Thus, works, good works together with the knowledge of God. So we find this Tabitha full of good works. 
pattern, Timothy was pattern of all good works. And filled with knowledge, with wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Increasing knowledge of God. When we do good works, our knowledge of God increases because we glorify his name. So, two specific purposes for good works. There are purposes of good works, but in God's plan, it is for the glory of God and for judgment. Because judgment are based on works, not on faith. But those good works are the byproduct of faith through God's grace. So Paul says, we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive things done in the body according to what he has done, works, whether good or bad. And they were judged according to their works. Behold, I can cope quickly. My reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So this is God's plan. God's plan is needed for judgment, not for salvation. These are really important. So there are two specific functions of good works. For the glory of God and for judgment. The problem is that we want to produce good works so that in judgment we are good. That is not. That is not the methods of God's of doing. That's why we have God's model, Paul. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer who live. Did you understand that? Because he died. It is Christ who lives in me. And the life now I live in flesh, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gives himself to me. Meaning to say, anything I do is not my own works. It is Christ now who is in me. So believers should not claim anything about good works that they have performed. When it is Christ living within, for he is working, not us. Our part is consent, cooperate, for it is God's, it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So good works in my own version, this is God's work in us and through us. They are the DNA of the people of God. It is the Holy Spirit initiated field empowerment into action, orientation, and lifestyle. So, works have been empowered, propelled, energized, produced by the Holy Spirit, has placement in the righteousness by faith, but not to merit salvation. Our good works alone will not save us, but we cannot save without good works. Remember that. Why? When we are not doing good works, means to say, God's grace in us is not working. Our works in the end of themselves do not merit. We deserve no thanks from God. There is a point that needs to be dwelt upon more firmly in the minds that of all the impossibility of fallen men meriting anything by his own best efforts and good works. That is an impossible before God. Good works are a result of the working of pardoning love. They are not credited to us. We have done nothing according for our own good works by which we may claim a merit in the salvation of the soul. Because good deeds are performed by the grace of God. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own good work in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. So, what was me do then? Let us believe. This is what God is saying. So, let me end up. You want a favor of your religious works to be saved? This is treason. Jesus imparts all the powers, all the grace, all the penitent, all inclination, all pardon of sin in presenting his righteousness for man to grasp living by faith, which is the gift of God. Listen to what Ellen White says. If you would gather together everything that is good, holy, noble, lovely in man, and then present the subject to angels of God as acting part in salvation 
if human soul or merit, that proposition would be rejected as reason. Treason. Faith and works. Page 24. Thus, I want to end. Let us think, rethink, think critically, think creatively, do redemptive thinking. Stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord. He will work for you today. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be still. Does God, does all? No, because the next verse says, Moses tell Israel to go forward. God has a part. The overall, but we need cooperation, consent. Let us go forward. First comes surrender, then comes spirit divine empowered action. Requires human effort and work of cooperation. Let no one take limited view, narrow position, that any of our works can help in the least possible way to liquidate the debt of his transgression. This is fatal deception. Now that you know which work for the praise and glory of God and the works that are judged as treason in heaven. So, I would like to appeal. When you read the Bible, see to it, that you look at the five categories of works. Four of them are treason. There is only one works of a Christian that is accepted. That is works because its foundation is love and it is acted by faith in Christ. Anything is them in heaven as a treason. So let us do what is God-pleasing, God-glorifying works, and surely we end up in the eternal life. This is my prayer.